Please join me in welcoming Professor Erlander. Well, first of all, let me say that the uh, chance to come here and speak to you um, is a great honor for me. And it's obvious that the people in Menominee and in this area have worked very hard to put this issue uh, before people in a way that caused them to want to think about it and talk about it a bit more. And if uh, through the course of the evening I can provide some uh, additional food for thought, uh, I'm sure that not everyone uh, will find uh, a reason to agree with me on everything I say. Sometimes I change my mind too, of course. Uh, but my intention is to raise serious questions in a way that causes us to think seriously about the nature of our democracy uh, and the nature of our country uh, and to ask ourselves serious questions about whether the fourth branch of government, the one that often isn't discussed, you know, we hear about the three, the you know, executive and the judicial and the legislative, uh, but we sometimes forget that the uh, power of the government is, uh, de is uh, derived from the uh, uh, consent of the governed. Uh, and it's that fourth branch of government, ordinary people, that through our history have provided the best insurance of continued uh, civil liberties and democracy. And my hope is that we as the fourth branch uh, can become active enough to make certain that the other three branches do their jobs as well. Today, uh, happily, I'm not going to uh, do a minute um, case analysis with you today, but we're going to talk a bit about general principles of uh, the development of governmental theory um, a bit of history, uh, how we got to this place, uh, and uh, what we can learn from that. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about some of the major features of not only the Patriot Act, but in many respects, administrative uh, claims of power beyond the Patriot Act are exactly, actually more troubling uh, than all of the aspects of the Patriot Act itself. Um, and I'm going to begin by trying to put uh, the situation in which we find ourselves in, in some sort of a context. My intention is to talk for about an hour, I hope a little bit less, uh, and perhaps uh, we can have a discussion uh, afterwards and a question and answer session. I'm sure I can't answer all the questions that you might have, uh, but I'm hoping that we open up some avenues for, for further discussion because this is the beginning of a very long discussion about the nature of our country. Well, in the way of introduction, I think we have to note that unlike the uh, peoples in most of the world's uh, nations, the people of the U.S. have had charmed existence. Prior to September 11th, 2001, there have only been two times in our more than 200-year history uh, that violence resulting from international disputes has reached our shores. The War of 1812 and 1941, and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Foreign invasions and wars fought on domestic battlegrounds are part of the collective memory of most of the people of the world, just not us. During the 19th century, wars between the nation states of Europe and the imperialist invasions by those states in Africa, Asia, and even South America are in the collective memory of all the people of the world. Following the proclamation of the Monroe Doctrine early in our history, announcing that South America and Central America were out of bounds to the imperialist powers of Europe, the US too engaged in foreign military adventures involving the US Marines in the Americas, the armed dismembering of Mexico, the invasion of Cuba, the Philippines, etc. In the 20th century, two world wars were fought in Europe and one in Asia, not to mention the proxy wars in third world countries during the Cold War. For most of the peoples of the world, experience has taught that foreign policy and its fallout can have direct and disastrous impact on the domestic tranquility of the civilian population. That's a lesson that we have not yet learned. The tragic events of September 11th have demonstrated clearly that despite the US's favored geographical position and the accumulation of the greatest military, economic, and technological power the world has ever seen, that the two-way reach of globalization's instantaneous worldwide communication network and network of financial transactions and the weaving of an international network of transportation of people and materiel, the United States can no longer consider itself and the people of the United States can no longer consider themselves immune from the effects of the foreign policies of the United States government. Now this may eventually come to be a positive result of the human tragedy that is on the same order of tragedy, of course, as the civilians that were killed in Afghanistan and those that have been killed in Iraq. Uh, 
uh, which is still going on today, although we don't have many news reports about the deaths in Iraq. Now, um, those citizens, like the citizens in, uh, and the people in the uh, World Trade Tower, were caught between their own government's policies and the efforts of other nations to exercise power in the Middle East and Central Asia. As we all know, the shock and outrage and, and grief that followed the deaths of the innocents on September 11th resulted, at least, at least initially, in a sort of self-reflective soul-searching regarding the role of U.S. foreign policy in creating conditions that contributed to the foreign policy related to the violence on our shores that I've mentioned. That could be a positive outcome of the tragedy if that self-reflection continues. However, the predominant response was an aggressive, largely unilateral military response that's been characterized as a never-ending war against evil. The most recent manifestation, or a recent manifestation, was a State of the Union message last year in which the President identified additional targets, the axis of evil, um, and justified a massive military buildup in the, uh, what President Eisenhower talked about as the military-industrial complex 40 years ago. In less than a year, we've gone from a government of surpluses to a government, a year and a half, I guess, to a government of surpluses to a uh, huge budget deficit of the same order. And if the current recession abates, uh, it will do so at the price of a remilitarized economy. Now, the other trend that we've seen is the immediate demand for increased power by the executive branch of our national government and even uh, the governments of states. In Minnesota, there was a state Patriot Act, a Patriot Act proposed in the last two legislative sessions, which was defeated. Uh, because of citizen action. Uh, and for additional powers for law enforcement and investigative tools to fight terrorism. The understandable desire of the American people to return to the pre-globalization state of peaceful isolation from the consequences of U.S. policy, foreign policy, and the comforting feeling of safety, security, and tranquility that were its result has been used by governmental officials to justify massive changes in the American legal system that frees the executive branches of government to impose a higher level of surveillance and investigative interference with the lives of ordinary people that make a mockery of the balance of powers in which the judiciary acts as a constraint on the executive power, and that reduce the democratic freedoms of association, the freedoms of speech, and the transparency necessary for a democratic process to function. My purpose today is to outline and catalog that wide range of increases in governmental powers that have been seized using the threat of terrorism as justification, and to consider the other related limitations on access to information and manipulation of existing dem domestic and international law in carrying out this war without end. I can only provide an outline. The details and the speed with which these changes and proposals are coming forward uh, have been breathtaking. And it's difficult for anyone to keep up, certainly for people engaged in normal life. And uh, the presentation today will be actually in four parts. We're going to talk a bit about previous uh, times in our nation's history that parallel the current situation to try and place this situation in context. I'd like to talk briefly about some major features of the Patriot Act. Um, uh, I call it the Anti-Patriotism Act, actually. Um, and review policies at the national level that are related thereto. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to talk about proposals that are being made for the future uh, that will be on the agenda in Congress and what they portend, and uh, some uh, thoughts about what the future holds and what the American people uh, can do um, in uh, responding to this. Uh, to begin with, I guess, it would be useful to... Uh, uh, reflect on a um, quotation that I'd like to read and uh, see if we can imagine uh, where this quote came from and when it was uh, uh, first, uh, uh, first made. We are currently in the throes of another national seizure of paranoia, resembling the hysteria which surrounded the Alien and Sedition Acts of the 1790s, the Palmer Raids of the 1920s, and the McCarthy era. Those who register dissent or who petition their governments for redress are subjected to scrutiny by grand juries, by the FBI, even by the military. Their associates are interrogated, their homes are bugged, their telephones wiretapped, they are befriended by government informers, their patriotism is questioned, 
It is not an exaggeration to talk in terms of hundreds of thousands of dossiers. If we consider the case of the JetBlue uh, Airlines uh, revelation the last few days, it's five million dossiers. Now this description of a nation in the throes of paranoia sounds remarkably like a description of current events and the future envisioned by the expansion of government investigative power that's been claimed since September 11th. But actually these are taken from a 1972 concurring opinion by Justice William O. Douglas in a case called United States versus U.S. District Court. Now for lawyers that's kind of a strange title because U.S. means United States government versus United States District Court. Why would the federal government be suing a judge or be suing a federal district court? Well, the reason for that is that this was a case that rejected the Nixon administration's claim of inherent presidential power to ignore the Constitution and to carry out widespread electronic surveillance and warrantless searches in the interests of domestic and national security. In the months and years to come, I think this case is going to be seen as central to determining the constitutionality of similar, similar claims under presidential authority uh, being advanced by the present administration. Now, the curiously titled case uh, arose because of the Justice Department's attempt at overturning a ruling by a federal district court judge named Damon Keith, who at that point was uh, uh, a judge, a federal judge in Detroit. Um, in that case, uh, a number of uh, young white men uh, who uh, called themselves the White Panthers had been engaged in anti-war protests on the uh, campus of the University of uh, Michigan, Ann Arbor. They were charged with a conspiracy to blow up a building on that uh, uh, campus. And the uh, White Panther defendants filed a motion requesting uh, discovery, releasing all of the information of electronic surveillance that the government had been involved in with their case. Now that was a, uh, what we call a boilerplate motion in, in the law, just when you file and just because you have to and it's just normal. But the normal response was for the Justice Department to stand up in court and say, well, there wasn't any, therefore there's nothing we have to turn over. So the boilerplate motion in this case resulted in a very um, unusual response. Uh, the U.S. Attorney in Detroit uh, stood up and read a uh, letter from um, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, uh, Mr. Mitchell, uh, Nixon's Justice Department. In that document, the Attorney General of the United States claimed that in the interests of national security, in order to pr protect the United States from its enemies, the President of the United States had the inherent power to declare people enemies of the United States and based on that declaration was able to engage in electronic surveillance, bugging, wiretapping at his discretion because as the President of the United States uh, he had foreign policy uh, power. Well, Justice Ke or Judge Keith, District Court Judge, uh, listened to that argument and remember this came from the top of the Justice Department. This was a formal challenge uh, to the District Courts to determine whether or not the Constitution applied to President Nixon. Uh, Justice uh, Keith went back in his chambers for about 15 or 20 minutes, came back out, and he said, well, I've gone back to read the Fourth Amendment, and I don't see anything in the Fourth Amendment that says it doesn't apply to Richard Nixon. <laughs> and so uh, he, um, uh, throughout the case, because of the use of illegally uh, garnered information and the use of illegal wiretapping. But of course, because this was intended to be a challenge that would establish the President's prerogative to engage in this sort of thing, the Justice Department appealed. So the Justice Department sued the judge, U.S. versus U.S. District Court. The case went to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, they upheld the judge, and then the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. This was the Nixon court. This was the court that William Rehnquist had just recently been appointed to. This was an opportunity for that court to establish that the president had the power to engage in surveillance at his discretion. Um, one of my heroes in the law, a fellow named Arthur Canoy, uh, who was a law professor at Rutgers, argued this case before the Supreme Court, and I'm sad to say that he just passed away two days ago. But in his argument to the Supreme Court, he uh, pointed out 
and that the history of the nation had been built on the notion of limited government, which is an idea that I'm going to return to when we talk about history. And that, as a matter of fact, without there being a limited government, democracy can't flourish because one of the contradictions in democracy is if we have ma majority rule only, this actually comes from James Madison, so we want to credit him, that, uh, that new voices can never be heard. That the future, which of course is already always influenced by the few who become the many, uh, uh, would cease to be able to function and the society would become static. And that even if there are uh, perhaps short-term justifications for the use of this governmental power, without limitations on that power, even if they're very popular, that in the long run, democracy withers and dies. That was his argument. He uh, uh, was afraid, he told me, about what the outcome would be. Went back home to New York, rated for the, uh, uh, the decision. He got a call from the clerk in the days before emails and, and faxes, and the clerk said, Mr. Kanoy, the judge, the court has decided it was eight to nothing. And Kanoy says, and he's this wonderful character, he says, oh my God, eight to nothing, what have they done to me? And then he asked what the decision was. <laughs> and the decision, according to the clerk, was, Mr. Kanoy, you won. It was eight to nothing because Mr. Rehnquist decided to, um, uh, not to uh, sit in on the opinion. He would have been the ninth vote. Of course, he was a member of the Justice Department at the time that the investigations happened and actually had authorized uh, some of them. So um, it was good that he uh, carried out his professional duty and didn't sit on the case. But another footnote to that case is probably even more important. The case was announced on a Monday morning in June. And the Supreme Court of the United States from coast to coast was declared on Monday morning that it was against the law for the President of the United States to carry out electronic eavesdropping without evidence of criminal uh, action. That he couldn't just declare enemies and carry out electronic surveillance at his whim. That was on Monday morning. On the Monday morning that that opinion was announced by the Supreme Court, there was a small um, article on the back page of the Washington Post that said, last night, the Watergate offices of the De Democratic Party were broken into. <laughs> you see, the, it was necessary for the plumbers to go into the Democratic headquarters to take out the electronic eavesdropping devices, as you recall. Had the court gone a different way on that Monday morning, and had they known the court was going a different way on that Monday morning, they would never have had to gone into the Watergate headquarters at all. Watergate would never have happened. We would never have found out what we found out about the plumbers, the FBI, COINTELPRO, all of the things that we learned about the misuse of government power during those years. And uh, it was one of those moments where you can see democracy hanging in the balance and turning on a thread. Now, I don't have anything that dramatic to report uh, about, uh, uh, about the current situation, but I do want to reflect on what that period in our history caused to occur. It was only years after this opinion was announced in 1972 that people learned anything about the connection between the case and the break-in. When it was announced in 1972, we didn't know what Watergate was about. That took several years for us to find out. Had the Supreme Court upheld the presidential power claimed by Nixon to, un to engage in unlimited electronic eavesdropping, it would not have been necessary to send Hunt and the rest of the plumbers in to remove the bugs. Some six months later, Nixon won re-election in a landslide, a huge landslide of popularity during a time described by Justice Douglas in 1972 when it was dangerous to ask questions or to oppose the president. But shortly thereafter, the revelations of Deep Throat, published by Woodward and Bernstein, led to the exposure of Nixonian misuse of the federal agencies from the IRS to the CIA and Hoover's FBI, and eventually to the resignation of Nixon himself. But it was not until the Church Commission meeting in, 1970, in uh, 1975 and 1976 that the American people finally learned of the widespread and systematic abuse by governmental agencies for political purposes beyond anything that most Americans would have imagined. 
the surveillance of Dr. King and other leaders. Lists of thousands to be sent to concentration camps in uh, case of a national emergency. CIA surveillance of domestic organizations, politically motivated IRS audits, black bag secret searches, COINTELPRO infiltration of legal political organization, false criminal charges, and even assassinations. Now, in 1972, when Justice Douglas and the court rejected the Nixon claim of this power, they could not possibly have known that this would eventually lead to an expansion of the Freedom of Information Act that would cause us to be able to find out more about what our government was doing. Provisions that have since been limited by the Bush uh, administration. Limitations on domestic CIA spying, which have been eliminated by the Bush administration. Limitations on sharing of information between federal investigative agencies, which have been eliminated by the Bush administration. FBI guidelines limiting infiltrations of churches and political organizations and attending, yes, meetings just like this to find out who's here, to take names, to find out who the potential supporters of terrorism might be in Menominee and other places of um, national interest. Now, it's not an exaggeration to say that the rejection, rejection of the imperial presidency by the Supreme Court in U.S. versus U.S. District Court led to new levels of the government transparency and limitations on the abuse of governmental power that Americans have come to rely on prior to the last two years as central to the democratic franchise. What we are seeing now is the systematic dismantling of post-Watergate protections against government abuses and claims of executive privilege that put into practice many of the worst aspects of the discredited Nixonian national security state. And they're not being done in secret they're being done in the open. And this is being done by a presidency no less committed to its own imperial prerogative, justified by the threat of terrorism rather than the Vietnam War and international communism. Now, irrespective of one's uh, opinion regarding the necessity or the wisdom of this vast claim of executive power, it is safe to say that there have been few examples in the history of the Republic during which there has been such a wide assertion of unfettered executive power and such thoroughgoing claims of executive privilege and secrecy. And that's a, a prelude, I think, to beginning to talk about the concepts of government that um, we need to establish in order to be able to think clearly about what's happening with uh, the Patriot Act and with the other claims of executive power that we see coming from Washington. One of the things that uh, my students in criminal procedure and my constitution law are amazed to find out is that when we are talking about the Bill of Rights and uh, who and what the founding fathers intended with respect to the Bill of Rights, um, what we can say with certainty is the founding fathers intended that there be no Bill of Rights. That when the uh, parties who were intent on forming a new central government in the United States met in Philadelphia, the plan was to convert a relatively decentralized government in which the power was in the states through the Articles of Confederation to an organized uh, national government that had the power to tax, the power to raise a standing army, the power to control trade. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the footnotes of the Constitution, you'll see that the first meeting that led up to the Constitution was a meeting held in Annapolis with the purpose of setting up a common market between the states. It was actually a commercial purpose that caused them to meet in the first instance. And during that meeting, George Mason, who was a drafter of the Bill of Rights of the state of Virginia, uh, suggested in sort of an offhand manner that, well, maybe there should be a Bill of Rights added to this document as well. Um, uh, he was, uh, uh, the response was a resounding uh, blank stare. Uh, lack of response, Mason went home because he didn't want to have, to have anything to do with the enterprise. Now the question, I guess, is if there, the Bill of Rights was not something that was intended by the founders, and uh, rather than uh, take my word for it, you might want to read Federalist Number 84. This was, of course, part of the Federalist Papers. The, the Federalist Papers, of course, were documents that the proponents of the Constitution drafted for distribution in New York to argue in favor of the change in government to this new, more centralized form. Uh, one of the things that uh, Alexander Hamilton argued in Federalist 84, quite convincingly, was there, there was no need for a Bill of Rights, and a Bill of Rights wasn't necessary, it shouldn't be part of the uh, Constitution. Well, 
if the proposers and the proponents of the Constitution didn't want a Bill of Rights, and we have one today, the question is, how did that come about? And the answer is quite simple. When the um, debate was going on with respect to ratification, there were two states that mattered the most. One was New York, the other was Virginia. Uh, both of them were populous states, rich states, large states, and if either one of them failed to agree to the common enterprise, uh, the colonies would have been split north and south, uh, the enterprise would have failed. So it was essential that both of those states, more so than Rhode Island, uh, would be uh, part of this new enterprise. The vote in New York was very close. The Federalist Papers helped turn the tide. Um, the uh, New York had passed. It came down to ratification in Virginia. The debate ensued in the ratification convention. Madison in favor of the new constitution, Patrick Henry, George Mason, a number of other notables against. And the argument that was put forward by those who were against the centralization of power um, was that the English had had a long experience with the need for particular rights. And this gets a, a little bit into constitutional theory, but I think it's, it's worth reminding ourselves how it is we got to this idea that somehow it was necessary to carve out these limitations on the exercise of governmental power in order for democracy to exist. Well, first of all, in uh, Federalist Number 10, James Madison said that the problem with pure democracy is that if a majority forms around any major subject without limitation, the majority will use its power against those the majority views as most obnoxious, according to his view, his words, those who are most obnoxious. And he said there's only two things you can do to solve that problem is either uh, limit the uh, effects of that process or eliminate the cause sources of faction. And of course, it's impossible to eliminate the sources of faction. He was also talking about economic faction, and, and this is another story. But as part of the, the theory of government, the idea was that if you didn't limit the power of the majority, uh, that democracy could not flourish uh, for the reasons that we talked about earlier, that in fact new ideas always come from the minority and the future is always determined by ideas that are minority ideas today, by definition. So, um, but he was still, along with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, against the Bill of Rights in Federalist 84. But we need to remember that the push towards independence uh, did not uh, begin with the demand for independence. It was a demand for being included in the English Bill of Rights that had been passed by Parliament in 1688 as a result of the restoration of the monarchy and an agreement between the aristocracy, the Parliament, and the Crown that there would be a division of power. It was an informal agreement, but one that stood the test of time, and they called that the English Constitution, but it was something that wasn't written down. It was a formal power-sharing agreement. But as part of that, the uh, Parliament, uh, going back to principles uh, as uh, uh, well-founded as the Magna Carta, where limitations on the power of the sovereign were, were written in uh, to a document, uh, that, uh, and a variety of other enactments over the four or five hundred years in between, uh, that the uh, people of England and the Parliament demanded that this English Bill of Rights be uh, respected. Well, when, the, uh, when, uh, Thomas Je when um, Ben Franklin uh, went to England for 20 years to lobby on behalf of the colonies and to lobby the Parliament, his argument was that the colonies should be covered by the English Bill of Rights. And it was actually the failure of the Parliament and the Crown to apply the English Bill of Rights to the new colonies that eventually caused uh, 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 Franklin to eventually come to the conclusion that he, as well as others, would have to declare an independent nation uh, in order to secure uh, the uh, economic and personal and civil liberties that were protected for the subjects of the crowd. So um, we had a, a situation where for almost 100 years, subjects in England had been used to the idea that there were limitations on governmental power. They'd gotten used to that idea. It was also true that there were bills of rights written into most of the state constitutions. And of course, uh, when written into Virginia, as, Virginia Constitution as well, as, as I mentioned. So when the debate began in the uh, Virginia House, it needed to uh, uh, pass uh, there in order for the Constitution to go into effect. Uh, the debate was furious. It came down to the wire. James Madison, 
One of the founders stood up in front of the uh, ratifying convention and said, okay, okay, will you support this thing if I promise to propose a Bill of Rights in the first Congress? And if you read his speech, which I asked my students to do, he eventually keeps that promise. He stands in front of the Congress and he says, you know, I'm really not so much in favor of these things myself, but I did promise. And there are some people who I respect that expect it. And you know, maybe it's something we should do because if it puts a, an end to the, these concerns that people have, well, so much the better. And of course, Madison is thought of as the father of our Constitution and he can legitimately be credited with that. But as far as the Bill of Rights is concerned, um, if he is the father, it was because of a shotgun marriage. <laughs> um, but the lesson to learn from that, it seems to me, is that the existence of the Bill of Rights itself was not something that was given to the American people. It's something that came from the concern that American people had for the centralization of power in the new government and the demand that government be limited because of their understanding going back at least 100 years that those limitations on governmental power were important, particularly if government could claim uh, universal power. Now, the, uh, uh, the history of our country makes clear that just having a Bill of Rights doesn't necessarily mean that they have much power. The Bill of Rights, as a matter of fact, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, right to counsel, all the things that we know about, um, actually uh, were, came under attack in the 1790s, less than a decade after they were passed. What happened was there was a threat of terrorism. Um, John Adams was the president. There was a country that uh, had ceased to become a functioning nation state. Terrorism was uh, on, the, uh, on the horizon. And of course, it was the original terrorism, the terror of Robespierre, the French Revolution. And the terrorism of the French Revolution so concerned the leaders of the United States, particularly in the Federalist Party, who were Hamilton and, and Adams, that they declared that any opposition to the US government at that time was sedition. And Congress people and press uh, people were locked up and put in prison for opposing US policy. In addition to that, uh, there were roundups of suspected terrorists who were rounded up and summarily deported. We made it more difficult for people to become citizens because, of course, you know the problems the French can cause. <laughs> well, the reason that, um, uh, that uh, we have a Bill of Rights today that functions is that uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists, who actually became the Democratic Republican Party. Madison went along with Jefferson much later and uh, saw some wisdom in the Bill of Rights. Uh, they began a political campaign to attempt to change this direction of the federal government. Uh, at that point, the Supreme Court wasn't even clear, that it wasn't even clear that the Supreme Court had the power to declare statutes unconstitutional, so they had to go about it a different way. They passed resolutions in a couple states saying that states could opt out of these uh, unconstitutional statutes and that states could declare something constitutional or unconstitutional. Uh, as a Kentucky plan, Virginia, I think, passed one as well. Uh, and there was a, uh, an ongoing political campaign uh, against the, uh, the seizure of power that was going on at that time. Uh, the Democratic Republicans, uh, Jefferson and Aaron Burr, dominated the, um, uh, the Electoral College. Uh, the, however, it was a split vote at that point. There was, the votes were between various candidates and they would figure out who was president and vice president by uh, horse trading in the Electoral College. Uh, and uh, uh, Burr uh, threw his support to, uh, to Jefferson. Jefferson became president. It was a small, minor uh, victory in the Electoral College. But what Jefferson did uh, is he allowed the sunset provisions in the alien sedition laws to go into effect. He released the people who had been uh, arrested and the Congress people and the press people that were in jail. Uh, he uh, uh, sought peace with France. Uh, he eventually, of course, uh, was able to conclude a way to purchase Louisiana rather than invading it and taking it over, which was Ham Alexander Hamilton's idea. Um, the result, of course, um, uh, was somewhat the same, although um, it uh, resulted in a, a different kind of government than we uh, might have been, might have had otherwise. Um, 
And uh, in, 19, in 1804, uh, when Jefferson ran for re-election, he was elected in the biggest landslide that the 10% of the American people who could vote at that time could possibly have given. Right? And that majority that Jefferson put together ended up being an electoral majority that lasted in a, in a cohesive uh, way up through and including the Jacksonian period uh, some 40 years later. It changed the American Republic and it was a reaction to that seizure of government power that did it. Not because the courts did it, not because the legislature did it, but because the fourth branch of government did it, even with the limited franchise we had at that time. Well, um, there are other times in our nation's history uh, that we know of that uh, uh, questions about what the Bill of Rights means has uh, been called into question. Uh, we know, for example, that, uh, uh, that uh, during the Civil War, uh, perhaps for justifiable reasons, because there was a war on our shores at that time uh, within our nation, uh, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus, put people in jail for opposing uh, governmental policy. A lot of these were people who were supporters of the South, either states' rights or slavery. There was a question at that time whether or not uh, Lincoln could uh, try civilians be before military tribunals. The Supreme Court said he could not as long as the civil courts were functioning, uh, which is an issue that, of course, is on our agenda now because we have a president that's claiming that it's possible to send civilians to military prisons uh, and to military tribunals based on the president's declaration that they're enemy combatants, uh, for which there is very little, if any, uh, constitutional precedent. That isn't the only time. Uh, we know uh, that uh, during the, there was a, a great uh, debate uh, regarding the invasion of Cuba, uh, the war in the Philippines. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Twain wrote some wonderful pieces talking about whether the United States Republic had lost its soul and become an empire. Now for a period of time, of course, it wasn't really possible to talk about an American empire. And people who did, at least during the Vietnam time, uh, were accused of being Marxists or communists or, uh, or rabble-rousers. Now, it's clear from the magazine section of the New York Times that we have an American empire. It's a pure claim that is being made at the highest levels now and justified uh, as a necessary uh, adjunct to the unusual position of dominance in which the U.S. Uh, finds itself economically and militarily. There are other times as well. Uh, during the, Civil, during the uh, uh, First World War, for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the publication of uh, tracts that would suggest that uh, perhaps this was a war of the rich, not a war of the ordinary people, uh, resulted in uh, war activists, anti-war activists being put in prison. And most of the First Amendment doctrine that we have come to understand as protecting our civil liberties today came from that period. There wasn't much First Amendment doctrine that existed in the Supreme Court prior to World War I. And it was a reaction to the government seizure of, of the initiative and locking people up who opposed World War I that the Supreme Court eventually reacted to and created this whole matrix of freedom of association, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the press that had existed um, in theory uh, but in practice not very much at all. We know, for example, that a terrorist bombing at the home of the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Palmer, resulted in tens of thousands of uh, anarchists, all of whom were foreign-born, of course, being swept up from the streets of the United States and deported uh, back to the uh, source of all the terrorism at that time, which was the Soviet Union. We know, for example, that during the 30s and 40s that political associations, whether one called oneself a socialist or a communist or whether one was accused of being a communist or a supporter of communism, meant that people lost their jobs. Uh, people uh, uh, actually, some of whom were, were executed. And, and, uh, uh, and we know that during that time it was also dangerous uh, because either you were with us or you were with the communists. Now, in more recent history, uh, we know that during the Vietnam War time, it brings us up to the period I was discussing with the U.S. versus U.S. District Court, a whole series of abuses had been shown that um, resulted from the claim uh, that the situation in the country was so dire uh, that it was necessary uh, to take this special action. That same sort of dire uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, claim of dire exigency, of course, is what resulted in the Japanese being put in internment camps as well during World War II. So there have been a lot of times in our history when the question of what the Bill of Rights means and whether the situation is so dire that we can't pay attention to it uh, has come up. And I'm happy to say that history has shown that when we look back in retrospect, many of those circumstances is a situation in which we feel some sense of embarrassment. And it's been those situations that have caused the American people to demand from their government that the promise of the Bill of Rights be held true and be given content. Now this idea of the fourth branch of government uh, is uh, an idea that I want to emphasize just a little bit because sometimes we think of ourselves as sort of uh, spectators in somebody else's show. But the government derives its powers from the consent of the governed, remember, in the theoretical sense. And initially, what was claimed to be uh, the United States was not really much of a democracy. It was a republic. It was representative of government and designed to have a limited franchise. People couldn't vote for president. They still can't. You can vote for the Electoral College, but you can't vote for president. We've seen the results of that this, this, last, uh, this last election. And of course, no one ever imagined in the history of constitutional law that the Supreme Court would choose a president. That was a, uh, a complete surprise for everybody across the political spectrum. And uh, it's hard to find the justification for that in the document, but um, yeah, certainly it, uh, uh, it happened. Uh, but what has happened is that as the 200 years experiment of being an American democratic republic has continued, there's been a trend in our country that makes me proud to be able to stand before you today and to talk with you about these things because you are part of it, and so am I. It was something that Frederick Douglass talked about. You know, he's the one that said that you know, those who want freedom without struggle you know, are those who want the crops to grow without the rain. You know? And if you want the crops to grow, uh, and that's freedom, uh, that struggle is the rain uh, that needs to fall uh, in order uh, for them to grow. But he said something else that I think is, is also important in terms of thinking about the nature of our governmental structure and this fourth branch of government. He said at the time of uh, slavery that, um, and, the, and the question was the Negro problem, the Negro question. And his response was, you know, there really isn't a Negro problem. The problem is whether the American people will have the courage to live up to the promise of their own constitution. And it's my thesis that for the last 200 years, ordinary people in the United States have demanded that the promise of the constitutional guarantees of democracy and equality and limited government that we see in the Bill of Rights has been the motive force that have given, that's given meaning to those uh, rights, to that expanding democracy. It wasn't, for example, an easy uh, uh, struggle uh, for people of African American origin to be able to be human beings. The vote for um, white men who didn't own property took a long time coming. It was 40 some odd years until the Jacksonian era where that happened. Women got the right to vote because the men magnanimously gave it to them? I don't think so. <laughs> Douglas said that power concedes nothing without demand. It never has and it never will, which was the prelude to the uh, quote about the rain falling. And it's my contention that we are now in one of those periods when the American people have the responsibility of determining for themselves whether we have the courage to live up to the promise of our own constitution, our own Bill of Rights. And it's a time when we can begin to determine the legacy that we will leave to future generations about the nature of the country in which we, found our, which we have found ourselves, in which most of us uh, find um, reason to stay in because we're proud of many things about it, as am I. But it's important to recognize what has happened. In the weeks following September 11th, the tragedy of September 11th, Rather than government taking an introspective view about what it was that had gone wrong 
that caused this terrible thing to come about. The claim was immediately made that there was no way that government could possibly have done anything to prevent or understand this thing. It was a complete mystery to all involved and therefore it was necessary for the executive branch to take power to begin to act in a more definitive way, to be able to find out where the enemies were among us. And they went to Congress and intimidated Congress into passing the Patriot Act. 342 pages of proposals that had been laying around Congress for years for which there was not adequate support. But in the weeks and the months after September 11th, in the atmosphere of fear that existed among the general population, and in Congress, when it was a time of either with uh, us or you're with the terrorists, that Congress, by a vast majority, passed a bill that most members in Congress will admit they never read. In addition to that, we've seen a series of executive actions by the executive branch of government and by the Justice Department that at other times in our history uh, would have uh, caused outrage. Now I've left a, uh, uh, I had a, a, an article that I wrote for the Star Tribune on September 27th of 2001 and I only brought 50 copies and happily there are too many people here to pass them out so there's a, there's a few in the back but uh, uh, it, it's uh, uh, something I can get more copies of. And, and the headline on the op-ed piece in the Star Tribune was Congress must thwart um, justice's power grab. I wrote that on September 27, 2001 because I've studied history. Because it was quite clear for those who's, who've studied history what was happening. And based on the understandable fear that people had at that time, there was a claim to reorder the nature of government itself. I'm not going to dwell too much on the particulars of the Patriot Act and the uh, various administrative uh, uh, issues that have um, uh, administrative measures that have also been put forward, but uh, some of them um, uh, I want to refer to just so we're kind of clear on what's really happened. And I guess in a general sense, what I want to say is that what we're seeing is a claim of executive power free from judicial oversight and unrestrained by either domestic or international law that has never been seen in the history of our republic. We have a claim that the Guantanamo naval base is an area of the earth that is not governed by either international law or domestic law. That it's possible on the island of Cuba to set up military tribunals in which the president appoints the judges, the prosecutors, and the defense attorneys to which there is, for which there is no appeal to the civilian courts uh, and that Mr. Rumsfeld can eventually decide whether or not the people there will be executed or not. Now this is the same nation, remember, that recently criticized Mr. Castro quite extensively for some uh, executions that were carried out on another part of that island, with more due process actually uh, than the proposals that we see being made uh, right now. In addition to that, we've seen on in the international arena the notion that uh, the idea of uh, cooperation and uh, collective action by nations is something that is passe. That preemption, that anticipatory strike uh, is the new standard upon which the actions of the U.S. will be judged and presumably those of other nations. Now we know a little bit about that, how that works. We can think about our block, for example. Imagine going to your neighbors and telling them that you reserve the opinion to bust them in the chops any time you thought that they might be a threat in the future. <laughs> the idea of having a civil society with that sort of philosophy uh, is really uh, 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 strains uh, credulity. Um, but on the domestic sphere, um, let's look at what some of these, uh, 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 some of these proposals uh, might be. We'll start, actually, and I want to make clear that I'm uh, an equal opportunity critic here. I've got some things to say about the Clinton administration as well, so I want to make certain that this is not, uh, this is not directed just at Republicans. As, as it turns out, there's this great movement that's happening in the United States between people across the political spectrum, and a lot of Republicans are involved, uh, 
that are as much concerned about this as I am. And I'll talk to that in just a, a minute or so, as my time is running out. Uh, but the Clinton administration said that it was possible for the Secretary of State to designate foreign organizations as being uh, forbidden. And the Secretary of State can make that determination uh, based on his or her own discretion. It changes every two years. It's not subject to any sort of meaningful review. And if the Secretary of State has put an organization on the list in which you are interested, and you send books or money or pens to a school that that organization is supporting, you could be sent to the federal penitentiary for 10 years. Now, of course, the impact of that on freedom of association, freedom of speech, and the notion that the people of the United States might have something to say about uh, international affairs, of course, raises uh, serious questions. In addition, Clinton passed a bill, and this was 1996, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. The reason for passing that bill, of course, was the terrorist attack originally that we thought was from Middle Easterners that came from a guy from Buffalo with short hair who was uh, a member of the US military. And of course, you know that there were these broad sweeps of uh, white guys with uh, short hair that followed it, right? <laughs> Yeah, and Buffalo, of course, became the source of uh, terrorists. Anyway, a little cynicism, I'm sorry. Uh, but the result was that this, uh, this procedure was set up that foreign organizations could be declared terrorists and you could be prosecuted for uh, supporting them uh, materially. That's what most of the prosecutions have been on recently, is the, the, most of the people that have been charged uh, coming out of September 11th and, and with the use of these new investigative powers has not been for acts of terrorism themselves. It's been material support of forbidden organizations. And uh, uh, that's been provided, that's provided the basis for a lot of guilty pleas because it's, uh, if you have sent some money or you have sent some, uh, uh, some material to the wrong organization, it's hard to defend yourself. In addition to that, um, uh, domestic organizations that have not broken the law can have their assets seized uh, and uh, without uh, uh, judicial uh, hearing. So that means that organizations that the United States government deems as being non-supportive of its policy, like the committee in uh, support of the people of El Salvador, for example, during the uh, middle, uh, the, the Central America struggles, uh, would uh, would not be able to continue to exist uh, under those uh, uh, under those uh, measures. But the Patriot Act went farther. Domestic terrorism is acts dangerous to human life that are violation of criminal laws and intended to influence government. Seattle. It's against the law to harbor or conceal any person that one knows or has reason to believe has, has committed or is about to commit one of these acts of domestic terrorism, like going to Seattle. Conflicts with rules of evidence. It allows covert searches without notification. It allows the back, black bag jobs that Nixon was doing and was uh, found to be improper. Um, the, uh, probably the, the uh, most broad-ranged uh, uh, change is the use of Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrants across a broad range of domestic circumstances. I told you, of course, that the CIA used to have a wall from domestic surveillance. Uh, what happened uh, in the Patriot Act is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts, which are secret courts that originally were set up to deal with spies, uh, have had their jurisdiction expanded so that law enforcement can use them uh, if they have some suspicion that foreign intelligence might be involved and any information that received from those secret warrants can be used in criminal prosecutions. That's new. Um, it also uh, 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 allows the shore sharing of information between the grand jury, the FBI, CIA, IRS, things that have been eliminated during the Nixon era. Uh, citizens, uh, non-citizens can be locked up for six months uh, periods based on uh, Mr. Ashcroft saying that they may be a threat to national security and that can be renewed every six months indefinitely. Um, and we've had a whole series of, uh, of changes in Freedom of Information Act requests. Now there's a presumption in favor of non-disclosure rather than presumption in favor of disclosure. Um, we've had uh, information that Congress has not been able to get and curiously Congress passed the, the Patriot Act and as they've asked the Justice Department uh, for information on what the Justice Department has done with the powers they were given, Justice Department won't tell Congress. Now, um, we also have a, a situation where people who are 
uh, claimed or accused of being enemy combatants, a concept that does not exist in the Constitution, uh, aren't covered by the Constitution. Uh, two citizens have been put in military prison, Mr. Hamdi and Mr. Padilla. Uh, they haven't been charged with a crime. They don't have lawyers. Uh, they are awaiting uh, the pleasure of Mr. Bush to decide how they are going to be treated. Coming up in the fall, we're going to be looking at Patriot Act II, uh, a limited version of the original Patriot Act II, uh, but what it will allow it would be administrative subpoenas issued directly by law enforcement without having to go to a judge. What that would mean is any federal official could issue a subpoena to you or to anyone else requiring you to come to their office, answer questions, bring documents, and if you declined, you would be subject to being locked up for contempt of court, whether they had any suspicion or not, based merely upon the request of the uh, investigative official. We know that the right to counsel is being undermined because now attorney-client conversations uh, can be bugged. And uh, actually, one of my, one of my colleagues, uh, Lynn Stewart, is being prosecuted in New York for, uh, uh, as a result of some of this bugging. Uh, due process, the right to bail, the presumption of innocence, and we know that there's uh, racial profiling going on. Out of the 350,000 people who are in the United States uh, who are out of status, immigration status, there are around 3,000 that have come from Middle Eastern countries. Of course, those are the ones that have been swept up. We also don't know who the people are who are still in custody. There are at least 1,000, maybe more. We don't know who they are or uh, where they're from. But I'd like to say that this is part of a really encouraging set of events. I mean, to see you here um, makes me proud to be an American. Um, because my theory, of course, it's the American people that we can rely upon. And we are the American people, uh, truth be told. And the American people have begun to respond. Within months after the passage of the Patriot Act and the declaration of these special privileges uh, for executive branch of government, there was an ordinance passed in Northampton, Massachusetts, a, a, a resolution actually, a Bill of Rights defense resolution the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts passed. So what? Right? Northampton, Massachusetts, who cares? But as a result and, as, and after that passage of that resolution, 166 cities across the country have passed Bill of Rights defense resolutions to this date. 200 more are meeting as we speak. The first national conference of Bill of Rights defense committees, I'm happy to say I'm, I'm playing some small role in organizing, is going to be in October in Washington, D.C., October 18th through the 20th. The people around the country who have been organizing spontaneously in their various cities for the first time are going to get together and meet each other. Who knows what could come out of that? <laughs> and the idea that there are groups meeting all around the United States that are actively taking responsibility for defending civil liberties is an example of American democracy of which we all should be proud. A struggle is going on in St. Paul right now. There's an election coming up and the city council members being asked to go on, on record. And of course the, the question is that, you know, well, this is a national question. We don't have to be concerned about the Bill of Rights in our town. Well, I suspect that all branches of government at all times, at all levels, need to be concerned about the Bill of Rights. And if they cannot go on record as defending the Bill of Rights, the question is whether they should continue to be in office. Yeah. There are also three states that have passed Bill of Rights defense resolutions. Right? The state like Republican Alaska, right? liberal Hawaii, right? and libertarian New Mexico. <laughs> At this Bill of Rights defense uh, uh, conference, uh, the meeting of the Bill of Rights defense committees, people are going to be speaking like William Sapphire, like Go Grover Norquist, who's one of the uh, foremost uh, Republican lobbyists. Um, we've found recently that uh, people like Bob Barr and Dick Armey have gone to work as consultants for the ACLU, an organization they wouldn't have talked to five years ago because this is not a Republican and Democrat issue. This is an American people issue. I'm happy to say that this movement is not just limited to us talking to ourselves and talking to our city council members. Uh, it's also going to go broader. We're going to go to every place that public opinion can be registered, from union halls to church groups 
uh, to student councils, every place the American people can go on record is demanding a respect for the Bill of Rights. We're going to put American people and civil society on record as defending democracy and the Bill of Rights every way we can. And we're not just limited to that. Because when we go to Washington, we're also going to have a, a day where we go into Congress. And we're going to talk directly to the people in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, about the importance of sticking with the basic principles that got us through this last 200 years and expanding the rights we have, not limiting them. Because that is really what makes America worth fighting for, right? That's why we're here. That's why it matters. And it is true that we have to be safe. And it is true that we have to be concerned about security. But our 200 years of history has told us that before we give up the rights that make us America, the government has to demonstrate to us that there is other alternative, and that has not happened yet. Yeah. There are also proposals in Congress. Uh, Bernie, uh, 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 Bernie Sanders from Vermont has proposed a, a bill that should make the librarians in the hall uh, proud. Because, of course, now librarians can be forced to turn over reading lists to the FBI just upon request. Right? Uh, some librarians are putting up signs saying, of course, if you use this library, you know that we have to turn things over to the FBI and we can't tell you about it. So think about that when you're checking out your books. Right? Sort of a notice provision. The American Libraries Association is working very hard on this. We also have uh, Congress taking actions like refusing to fund the sneak and peek searches in the Patriot Act, the secret searches. Congress said no to funding those. Uh, we know that there was a great uproar when the total information awareness proposals of, uh, of Admiral Poindexter came out. Now it's called, uh, uh, it's called terrorist uh, um, uh, information awareness, right? Uh, and it's coming back in a different, different guise. We know that there's a list of 100,000 people who are soon going to find out that they're not going to be able to get on airplanes. Not because uh, they've done anything, but because of what they might do. And it has nothing to do just with terrorism. It has to do with finding about your financial records and a whole variety of other things. But the question is, who's going to be making those decisions? Under what authority? In what rooms? Under what source of review? Now, um, I hope that I leave you with a message of um, uh, renewed pride in who we are as a people and a renewed sense of what we have accomplished as a people and renewed commitment to what we must do to have a future as a people. But I propose to you that just as Frederick Douglass said, the question for this generation is whether we have the courage to live up to the promise of our own constitution. Thanks for letting me come here tonight. Dr. Erlander is, is very happy to entertain any questions. Um, I would suggest that somebody were to stand, and then uh, you can ask a question. W would you do the choosing for me? I, I would be glad to. Yeah. Yes, sir. John Williams, I wanted to ask a question. I noticed in reading this uh, Tenth Amendment um, that the powers that are not restricted by the Constitution, uh, the Constitution are given to the states. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, along with these resolutions that are being drawn up by town councils, whether it would be appropriate for state legislatures to take a look at their bills of rights mm -hmm. for the same purpose. Um, I think so for a couple of reasons. One is uh, as a uh, just to register public opinion and political opinion that has a that has a. Um, I think a material force over time, and we've seen that happen already in the three states that I mentioned. Uh, but there's possibilities to carve out areas of local autonomy, both at the state level and the local level, that wise um, governmental officials can find. For example, in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis City Council not only passed the resolution in philosophical support of the Bill of Rights, but they passed a subsequent ordinance saying that city funds could not be used for immigration enforcement. So when Mr. Ashcroft came to speak in Minneapolis uh, last week, uh, without much notice, by the way, but that's another story, uh, he was speaking in a city where he could not order the local law enforcement people to do what he wanted them to do or what immigration wanted them to do because the city council had said that they're not going to spend the funds that way. And the reason was because many people in city government understood that if people who are 
uh, have concerns about their immigration situation or concerns of others that they might be close to or others in their neighborhood, it would be less likely that they would call the police when they were needed, less likely that they would cooperate with city workers as that cooperation was necessary. And the city council decided that it was a matter of protecting the safety and interests of the people of Minneapolis to make sure that people without, um, who had immigration problems uh, could avail themselves of city services uh, without, um, without worry and that, that made everyone safer. And I suspect that there are things like that that uh, might be able to be done at other state and, and local levels of government. Of course, that would be require analysis of each particular entity that we'd be talking about. Thank you. Yes, uh, you've given us some examples of a history in which rights have had to be wrestled away from government by the people and in which there is uh, a tendency for government to restrict rights and liberties, uh, Aliens and Seditions Act and the present situation and so on right. through history. I is there something in um, our culture, in the manner in which our government was established that creates that tendency for government to want to restrict rights? Well, um and I'm, I'm, on this you know, question, of course, I'm not an expert, and there are wiser people than I have said things like um, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's kind of an old saw. Yeah. Right? And James Madison said about democracy that a democracy, uh, that unrestrained democracy means the majority will pick out those that they view as most obnoxious and use their power against them. Who's more obnoxious than those that we fear? Like terrorists, right? or who we might label. <coughs> or the other, the foreigner. I mean, that's, that's a, an old story, and it's a repeated story. It's not something that's going to end with there will be other crises in the future. The question is whether we are going to struggle to give content to the rights and to the notions of de democratic government that have brought us to this place so that we can carry on the next struggle at a higher level. And uh, I want to make clear that, this is, that in my view, this has not just been a repetitious cycle because it's taken place over the last 200 years at higher levels of expectation by the American people. There is no way that we would go back to the limitations on First Amendment freedom or sending people to, um, uh, sending uh, journalists to prison as happened in World War I. There's no way that rights are gonna be, that the, vote to, the right to vote's gonna be taken away from women or African American people. Um, so uh, our struggle is to give birth to those ideas anew at a, at a higher level uh, of, um, of a democracy and equality. Yes, Ms. Uh, is there anything to be learned from the way, for example, the French dealt with Algerian terrorism or the Brits with the IRA, and the way they handled that? Well, I, I think so. I mean, the, there are alternatives to uh, thinking about how to resolve a problem of non-state uh, military uh, violence. Um, and uh, there are a lot of examples of that. I mean, we, there are times when we've called these things police actions as opposed to wars. Um, there are times when uh, we have um, uh, lavished um, uh, 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 resources uh, on countries to make it less likely that opponents would grow up within those countries. Uh, we've decided on a strategy, at least the U.S. policy leaders have, have decided on a strategy. That act, actually, one of the things kind of a sidelight, but I want to mention is that um, if, if folks in the audience get a chance to look at the plan for a new American century, it's on the web. It was published in 1998 by Mr. Wolfowitz and, and uh, Mr. Pearl and, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Rumsfeld. The plan for a new American century sets out as a policy objective the establishment of military dominance of the United States uh, over the rest of the world. Uh, for the next century under the notion that if the U.S. has this military power, it should control um, the ability of other industrial powers to rival the U.S. And uh, a lot of the struggle I think we see between the U.S. and France and Germany right now is that, the, um, uh, is that Europe understands that controlling the oil from the Middle East isn't just to sell it, it's to make certain that they can't get it either. And uh, which has implications for foreign policy in the long run. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, there are lessons, positive lessons, negative lessons. But if you th that document makes clear 
what it is these policy, uh, uh, what policy these folks are following uh, in their own words, not, not in mine, it's in their, their own words. Yes. Since you bring up PNAC, it's, uh, as I recall, it's more around page 58 of that document. It says uh, that the order in which uh, military operations should be proceed would be first Iraq, then Iran, then Syria, then Korea. And it then notes, this was written in 1998. Uh -huh. The next sentence, more or less, is it will be difficult to mobilize public opinion to justify a war against Iraq barring a Pearl Harbor-like event. Uh, I just... Well, thank, thank you for, for making more explicit <laughs> what I was trying to say. Uh, reading that document is really important for American people to understand the, the direction that, the, that our policy is intended to go. It doesn't have to go that way, but I think there is a, a, conscious, a conscious statement about what, what's going on. Yes? Are you familiar with the present uh, challenge to FISA? There's a court challenge going on right now. Um, yeah, I, I think you could you say that a little louder, please? I think people didn't hear it. Challenge, the court challenge to FISA. Yeah, there's there are a couple challenges, um, um, but none that have worked their way or are close to working their way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, the military tribunals are being challenged. The Guantanamo situation is being challenged. Um, there, what happened with the FISA courts is there was actually kind of a. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, thank you very much. It's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts. Um, I talked to you about that case, U.S. versus U.S. District Court, that, uh, where they said that the Supreme Court said Nixon didn't have the power to do this electronic surveillance. But it also said that in cases of foreign intelligence surveillance, that there might be some special powers. As a result of that exception, Congress created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts in 1976. Um, those courts are, it's a court that's appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States. Um, the justices, uh, the judges on the court are designated in secret. The court meets in secret. Um, the upper levels of the Justice Department originally were the, those that would go and seek a warrant. It wasn't the lower level. It had to be approved at the highest levels. And what they had to show was that the person was an agent of a foreign power, not that they were involved in crime. Uh, the reason that there was the debate in Minnesota about what to do with Massawi is they were trying to decide whether he was an agent of a foreign power or not. It's the reason they didn't get the warrant uh, at that time. Although the fact is that the FISA courts, um, as of a year ago, had granted over 10,000 warrants and never rejected one request. So um, we have a secret court that grants warrants regularly, but it form formally it was just for spies. The Patriot Act says that now those secret warrants can be used um, in any situation that might implicate foreign intelligence. Uh, not that the person's agent of a foreign power, but there may be some connection somehow, um, which is a broadening of the, the use of the FISA Act uh, courts. And then they also said that evidence that comes from these FISA warrants can be used in criminal prosecutions, which has never been the law before. Um, the, um, the FISA court itself um, had complained about the lack of uh, rigorous presentation of evidence by the FBI. And uh, they asked the uh, federal, um, the, F, the FISA appeals court, which had never met before in history, as to whether they had the power to do what the Patriot Act said they had the power to do. And the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act appeals court uh, met in the spring of 2001 and said, yes, they did. Uh, but beyond that, the challenges, uh, challenges about the constitutionality of the FISA court are going to be very hard to make if foreign intelligence is involved. There's going to have to be some case where it goes beyond that and then work its way up. But we're years from that happening. And one of the things I want to make clear is that the way issues get to the Supreme Court is a case happens, works its way up. The Supreme Court may or may not hear it. It may take several cases. Um, it can take a decade or more. Uh, for, these, uh, for these issues to get to the Supreme Court. And even if it does get to the Supreme Court, Bush versus Gore. Yeah. The fourth branch of government is the one that counts.
there's a question way in the back here. Yes, uh, you spoke about uh, the Electoral College uh, actually is along the side of the presidency. Uh, in your opinion, what's a viable way to counteract that? And, and uh, what kind of organization should be there instead of that? Still uphold the ideals that the, the demo, uh, uh, politicians need to uh, focus on everybody in America, not just the large populated areas like What's a better way than Yeah, that, that's a real conundrum. And uh, I have to say that I haven't um, researched or written about that enough to consider myself an expert. Um, the point I was trying to make was that um, we need to understand that the, we don't have a direct franchise to elect the president. We didn't have a direct franchise to elect senators until the turn of the century, the uh, turn of the 20th century. They were chosen by state legislators before that. There was so much corruption in that that eventually they, it went to a, a, a general franchise vote. Uh, how the Electoral College might be restructured, if it should be restructured, um, I'm not sure I'm wise enough to be able to suggest an answer for that now. But um, what we can say um, is that um, under the present circumstance, there is no requirement that electors uh, vote in the way that their constituents um, uh, voted. So we have a an institution that really exists without clear guidelines. And there have been some suggestions that perhaps uh, percentages of vote uh, should be uh, considered in the Electoral College, uh, not uh, uh, all the votes going to uh, one candidate who has the uh, plurality, for example. But the, but the votes in the Electoral College should be split as well, which would be a little bit closer to reflecting the, the, uh, uh, the electorate. But that's a, a question that's really complicated in terms of uh, electoral uh, philosophy and, and, uh, and theory. And um, I'm having a hard time figuring out the Patriot Act, frankly. That's, that's, that's beyond my, my scope. Um. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you keep mentioning about the fourth branch of government in uh -huh. the Republic and how in the past it's risen to the occasion, if you will, to overturn what's seen as a gradual authority by the executive branch. Yet if we look at studies in the American public today, um, it's been argued that there's been a trend and a decline in both the interest and activity of the American mass public. How do you see the way of really galvanizing and grabbing their attention about this issue, but then also um, informing them as to what their duty is. Well, one way is driving to Menominee on Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. um, we have to talk to each other. And it's not, this is not an easy matter. I mean, we're talking about, and, and the thing I have to make clear is once, what history also has shown is that once government gets these powers, uh, it's very hard for government to give them up, whether it's a Republican that has them or a Democrat that has them. And even if there's a change in the White House, that's not going to mean that these powers are going to be given up easily. Uh, it's going to take someone like a Thomas Jefferson who, um, uh, who undid the Alien and Sedition Act um, in the 1790s. Um, but it's going to be a lot easier for any politician to make that decision if it's clear that the American people are demanding it. And, but it's a long struggle. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we're in for a decade or more. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of following on hers and, and the, uh, the guy up front, I think uh, it seems that it's also true that industrial economy corrupts absolutely. And I'm wondering if there's any, I'm trying to understand, I'm having difficulty understanding the, the motivations at the top. And, and until I look at the, the WTO and the the business culture and the lack of conscience in the corporate structure. There's no conscience built into it. And so I'm wondering if you have any insights into, in, from your historical viewpoint, into how this, this all works to. Well, I'm really glad you raised that question because it can get me back to James Madison again. You know, I, 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 uh, I told you that his, his theory was that the problem with a pure democracy is that majority will use its power against those the majority views as most obnoxious. It's in Federalist 10. What he also said in Federalist 10 is the most durable source of faction in any society is the difference between those who own property and those who don't own property. And uh, that uh, there's all the manufacturing interest, the landed interest, the mercantile interest, uh, all operate in their own uh, interests and uh, they find themselves at odds with those who don't own property. 
He understood the world in class terms. When I, when I read this quote to my class in, in constitutional law and ask him who it is that said that, you know, half the class says Karl Marx. And, <laughs> but it's there in Federalist 10, right? And, uh, and he understood that one of the problems with democracy, if you think about those who don't have property and those who do own property as being the dividing line, is democracy was a very scary thing for him and for a lot of the people who proposed the, bill, the Constitution. And the idea that, that democracy should be limited was built into the system that they set up. Property ownership was one of the requirements to vote, for example, you know, in most of the states. So this idea that there's a contradiction between democratic decision making and property interests goes back to the very early days of our Constitution. Yes, yes sir. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier that uh, there, immediately after 9-11 there really wasn't much in the media regarding why it happened. Right. What were the causes of it. Right. I'm just wondering to the extent that, that we as a nation, as a nation, as a country, have, have refused to look at the real causes of 9/11. Uh, to what extent has, has our, you know, re refusal to look at that led to the things like Patriot Act, abuse of power that we see going on right now? I don't know if people heard the question. Yeah, I don't. Okay, um, he was asking uh, about the issues I raised about a um, uh, failure to examine what the causes were for 9-11 and the uh, shortcomings that might have existed in, in uh, the use of governmental power before that time. And, and, um, uh, the, uh, and you heard me, I think, as, as saying some of there was a refusal to do that. And I, I want to change my, the impression that I gave you. Um, it wasn't so much a, a, a refusal uh, on the part of the people to uh, f asking. It was a refusal on the part of government to tell. And what's happened is that um, new limitations on the access of information to previous uh, administrations. I mean, for example, uh, a lot of information on the, the uh, uh, Gulf War and on uh, the Bush I presidency, uh, which should have been disclosed under normal, uh, uh, normal measures up until this time, has been, uh, has been held secret. Um, the Freedom of Information Act has been limited in terms of what it can get at. Congress has attempted to get information. They can't get information. There's been a stonewalling on a whole lot of areas and a secrecy on the part of government that's made it difficult to find out these questions. Um, there actually are some groups there's, uh, that are trying to, uh, and, and survivors groups of people who were, whose, uh, whose relatives uh, died in the World Trade Center are trying to get answers. There's even a lawsuit filed against Saudi Arabia for uh, supporting uh, the, uh, uh, the hijackers. Um, and there may be some information that comes out there, but I think it's not been a lack of interest. Perhaps initially the fear kind of swept over everyone and it was just, you know, what are we going to do to protect ourselves? But I think the questions have been, are beginning to be asked and have been asked for a while, but there's a resistance to answering the questions. Way up on the right. This might be a bit out of context, but um, how familiar are you with uh, school in America? Well, I, I know a little bit about the School of Americas, but not enough to um, uh, consider myself an expert. I know that it, it's no longer called that. They call it something else now, and, and, uh, uh, but they're still training people from uh, the military from South America and Central America, I understand. But I'm, I'm not an expert in that. Now, the School of the Americas he was asking about, and that's a, uh, uh, at a, neighbor, or at a uh, military base in Georgia. What's the... It's a Fort Benning uh, in Georgia, and it's a, uh, it's a military school where um, the military from other countries are brought into the United States and trained. Uh, and uh, for a number of years, it was quite clear that they were being trained in human rights abuses and assassinations, things like that. Uh, there's been some, and there have been a lot of demonstrations and protests down there, and the Berrigans have been arrested, a lot of people have been arrested, and uh, there's been some notion that the name has changed, I guess, and I don't know what the content has, has changed or not. But I know about it, but not enough to really talk about it intelligently, I'm afraid. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, it seems to me after 911 that the, the issue really is fear. Um, one of the things that I think that we need to be able to address is the issue of fear. And you are making the case that, that something might be more fearful than the other, the, our loss of civil liberties. Can you say something more about how 
the civil liberties um, concern is a greater, should be a greater fear to us than, than other fears that we might have. Okay. Um, well, I guess the, the first thing I would say is, uh, um, is that if we um, still believe that, um, that in the long run, limitations on government power are necessary uh, for democracy to exist. Um, and if we are living in the most powerful nation the world has ever seen, that the misuse of that power is a terrible threat beyond anything that would be imaginable from a disorganized, even well-funded, non-nation state, Taliban, uh, Al-Qaeda. Um, and as, um, uh, as evidence of that, I think you just have to look at what happened in Iraq. The military power and the, the coercive power that this government has is enormous and extraordinary. And the question of what's going to happen rebuilding the Iraq is on the agenda, but there isn't a nation on earth that didn't learn a lesson from that Iraq war. Um, and the American people can also see what it is that, that the American government is capable of. It's a huge power. And uh, uh, the question uh, that the, uh, the, that the uh, uh, folks who, who insisted on the Bill of Rights were faced with was how to deal what they learned from was how to deal with the vast power of the greatest imperial nation in that age. The English people found that they needed a Bill of Rights when England was the preeminent and growing imperial power. I don't think the situation has changed substantially. Um, we can differ about what particular measures, however, should be taken. I want to make clear that there are things that should be done for, uh, for safety purposes. I have no objection to being uh, uh, asked you know, questions and to go through the airport uh, devices and that sort of thing. Um, I have no objection to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the idea that um, we should fund first responders really well so that fire and local police you know, can, can uh, pay, uh, pay close attention to their duties and, and fulfill them. What I do have a, an issue with is when the structure of government has changed because when that happens, we're all in great threat. Yes. Our, our own community has had real interesting experiences with, with uh, some issues. Uh -huh. And uh, in, in one of those situations, uh, people became very uncivil to each other. There was a lot of name calling. There was a lot of accusations of disloyalty. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, Joe even was um, attacked about something that had nothing to do with the fact that he's a, a legislator. Um, <clears throat> my, my observation of this experience showed me that there needs to be a critical mass of people who have courage to stand up and, and not be afraid to speak up. And you've spoken to us about what needs to be done, and I'm wondering how big do you think that critical mass is going to need to be? Well, um, the war for political independence was won even though two-thirds of the country either was against it or didn't care. Um, an animated minority uh, can influence policy enormously. Uh, during Vietnam, the opposition to the war was probably never really a majority of the, of the population. Not, the majority was never involved in the anti-war movement itself. Um, a majority was never involved in the um, uh, civil rights movement. Um, but an organized grassroots movement of people can have an enormous impact beyond their numbers. And as I mentioned, getting back to Madison again, it always starts with a minority. The future is always suggested by a minority. And, uh, and I have to tell you, when I wrote that piece in, in uh, September 27, 2001, I was scared to write it. And I was attacked. And I got hate mail. And occasionally I still do. And I actually consider it as kind of a badge of honor because it means somebody's listening. Uh, and it also opens up an avenue to talk. Because I think that most people who uh, are um, 
in favor, uh, think they're in favor of uh, the change in governmental structure. When a discussion happens, it happens at a deep level in a non-accusatory way that causes people to think about the things that really matter to them and to this nation. It's amazing how um, people's um, attitudes can change and particularly uh, now that you see that both Republicans and Democrats are raising a lot of these issues, this is not a partisan issue. It's becoming bipartisan. Maybe we will entertain two more questions. I know there was one over here, and is there somewhere else? Way up there? Okay, please. And then, and then we will we will have this question and one other one, okay? Yeah, first I just want to make one comment. Um, I think one of your answers about going back and taking away votes. Uh, something that occurred right after 911 was then Attorney General, now Governor, tried to pass through possession of a, just a simple bullet was a felony. And of course, felony, you lose your vote. That's just one thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I did want to get back to you, the, uh, um, the statements made about the origin of the Bill of Rights. Was not one of them that it was thought it was not needed in the Constitution because it was redundant, that it was an inalienable right from the Creator, that, that the power came from not the parchment. And I think that's something that's for, you know, remember who it applies to. It doesn't apply to Americans because the Creator created everybody. Well, in, the, uh, in Federalist 84 is where Hamilton made the argument that we didn't need a Bill of Rights. And what he said was that in the old kind of government, the sovereign claimed all of the power from God. And the reason that rights were necessary is we had to carve out these little areas of autonomy from the power of the sovereign. Since the government that we have is one that we give power to by the document itself, we don't have to limit it any further because it isn't given the power to abuse um, its, its prerogative. Um, however, that argument failed largely because people, I think, drew the conclusion that if you give someone the power to raise a standing army, it means the power to hold a gun to your head. And the power to, um, to tax means the power to get into your pocket. And the power to regulate commerce means how you can make a living. And what the folks who I think wanted the Bill of Rights were concerned about is once those powers are given, how they're going to be used um, is anybody's guess. So um, uh, while it may be that these are rights, the natural law rights, and uh, apply to all people, without specifically delineating them, at least according to the thinking in England and, and then uh, in America later, um, those rights are hard to hang on to because they become so ephemeral that we can debate them. Uh, even if we specifically describe what they are, we debate them and what they mean. Um, but I think that, that the conclusion was that we at least had to state them clearly uh, or uh, the, the likelihood would be that over time um, we'd have a, a tendency not to be able to enforce them. No, I, don't, I don't disagree with them being written down, but the, you got to look back at the preamble to the whole thing is, you know, we hope these truths to be self-evident. And that's what said they, you know, these things apply to everybody, not just one little group or, you know, they don't come from the parts, they don't come from a piece of paper. Well, well that, the theory of natural rights is underlying all of this. That's true. <coughs> Last question. Joe? Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that there is no correlation between the Patriot Act and the 9-11 terrorism event, and that even if the Patriot Act had been uh, in effect before 9-11, it would have no effect whatsoever because 9-11 was the result of failures within certain departments and corruption in our government. What is your opinion on that? Because you're familiar with the Patriot Act. Well, um, 15 out of the 19 involved uh, were, here on, uh, were here legally on legal visas. Um, there's nothing in the Patriot, Patriot Act that prevents someone from getting a legal visa or getting a visa if, if they qualify. So that um, might mean more scrutiny with respect to whether they would get a visa. Uh, but there's nothing that indicates, that there's no, there, there was no showing that anything that, um, that's in the Patriot Act would have changed the outcome in 9-11. In, in I don't think that even Ashcroft has made that argument directly. Well, Dr. Erlander, I appreciate you being here this evening Thanks. and educating us, and, and please join um, the community
in the in the uh, basement for coffee and juice and uh, some bars. So okay. thank you all for being here.